Welcome to the Core Concepts Lecture Series. This is the show where we have religious and spiritual leaders come and tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. This is sponsored by Open Heart Spiritual Center and the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. Our guest today is Pastor James Ware. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about something that many of you may never have heard of, the Restoration Movement. This is the American Restoration Movement that took place, I believe, in the 1800s. Yes. And um, from this, at least three denominations formed, split, or came about. And that is the Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church, and the Churches of Christ. And so we welcome James Ware uh, to the program. Good to have you. Good to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and to speak to you today. Uh, the Restoration Movement has its roots in the Presbyterian Church from Scotland. Uh, John, uh, Thomas Campbell and Alexander Campbell. Thomas was the father, Alexander was the son. Uh, uh, Thomas was a minister in the Presbyterian Church back in the late 1700s. Uh, during this period of time, from the middle 1600s to up to the 1800s, the Presbyterian Church went through some changes and there were some uh, divisions that occurred within the church. Not going to go deeply into that, but there was basically four factions within the Presbyterian Church. The seceders, the non-seceders, the burghers, and the anti-burghers. And uh, what was causing this was the seceders uh, believed that each church should have the right to choose its own minister without having a bishop or someone tell them who had to be the minister. Uh, once a minister was chosen, it was required in Scotland that he take a burger's oath. Uh, it's B-U-R-G-H-E-R, burger's oath. And uh, the, the burghers believed that uh, anyone could administer the oath for a minister, and uh, the anti-burghers believed the oath had to be administered by someone within the church or the clergy. Now, the reason why that becomes important, you'll see in just a minute, uh, Thomas Campbell became frustrated with this whole issue that was going on, and in 1807, uh, he came to the United States and when he got here, he became part of the uh, seceder, uh, anti burger Presbyterian Synod. Uh, as a circuit minister at that time, uh, he was required, of course, to go out into rural areas and uh, provide ministry to people. And after coming back in from one of those, uh, he was uh, summarily defrocked and excommunicated for the fact that he was having communion with people who were non-seceders <laughs> and who were not of the right faction of the Presbyterian Church. And so consequently, uh, he became uh, a kind of an independent at that point. While all of this was going on, his son Alexander Campbell was still in Scotland with Thomas's family, and Alexander going to uh, a religious service in the Presbyterian Church was concerned or became concerned because uh, in order to take communion, uh, you had to prove that you were worthy of being able to take communion and you were given a communion coin. So that when communion was passed to you, you would take the communion and drop your coin into the plate. Uh, and without a coin, you were not worthy to take communion. He became dissatisfied with that idea, and uh, as a result, he laid his communion coin down in the pew and got up and walked out. Upon arriving uh, in the America, uh, he found that his father had to explain to the family, I've been excommunicated and defrocked. And Alexander says, well, that's okay. I've walked away from the Presbyterian Church with no chance or hope of desire to ever go back. Uh, at that point, uh, they decided that they were going to just do something completely different, but they didn't really know what they wanted to do. But they knew one thing that they wanted was to have a religious philosophy that did not require creeds. Uh, all of your religious groups of those days 
had creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and you had to memorize and learn this creed and adhere to it if you wanted to be a member in good standing of these different denominations. And so they decided, you know, there should be no creed except Jesus Christ. That is our creed. And the second thing that they wanted to establish was where the scriptures speak, we speak. And where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. So that they looked at the book of Acts and said, this is what the New Testament church is supposed to be. And they wanted to model what they were doing as closely as they could along the lines of the New Testament church as it was being described uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, they got together and they formed uh, what was called the Christian Association of Washington, Pennsylvania. Uh, but they only met twice a year. And they met basically for discussion and for uh, communion. And, uh, uh, and they allowed anyone who wanted to take communion could come and take communion. You didn't have to know a creed. You didn't have to uh, give a testimony. You didn't have to even be... Uh, a Christian. I mean, anyone who wanted to take communion was welcome to come. And didn't take. even need a coin. Didn't even need a <laughs> coin. And you didn't have to adhere to any specific uh, branch of any uh, specific church. Uh, they moved the Christian Association away from Washington, Pennsylvania, uh, and, and moved to a place called Brush Run Valley. And so it was uh, in July the 4th, 1811, they held their first actual church service. Uh, they started this with about 30 members, and uh, they grew from there. And uh, one of the things that was an influential part of, and still continues to be part of what is part of the, the influencing the three denominations today, is that Alexander had a child. And uh, when his child was born, uh, then the discussion came up of what about child baptism? What about pedo baptism? All of the Presbyterians had been sprinkled when they were babies. And now he searched the scriptures to determine whether or not this was scriptural. He came to the conclusion he didn't believe that infant baptism was scriptural. And so he uh, went out and took his whole family and they were baptized by immersion. Um, he also came to the conclusion in making that study that without baptism, there is no salvation. Now, this is something that still is a point of discussion and debate and contention among many members of the churches of Christ, the disciples of Christ, and the independent Christian churches. Many people within these different denominations still believe and adhere to if without baptism there is no salvation. Well, because this became something of an, uh, this and other issues became uh, to the forefront early on, uh, Thomas Campbell decided, you know, he said, what we really need to do is to have a guiding principle, not a creed, but a guiding principle. And he says, you know what, the only important thing is we need to have unity. Unity in one thing, and that is that Jesus Christ is our only creed. Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross as atonement for our sins. That's the unity. We all have unity in that thought. Other than that, other issues, other debates, other questions, we're going to have liberty. We'll allow people to have liberty of thought and to think differently and to believe differently. We don't all have to believe the exact same thing on every scriptural or spiritual issue in order to be in fellowship with each other. So we have unity of one belief, liberty of everything else, and in all things we have charity. We have uh, love for one another. And so these were the three guiding principles upon which they wanted to, to make sure that the people that they were, were part of their group was 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 involved in this. There was different things that they did early on uh, because they were small. At one time they were part of the uh, Redstone Baptist Association. A lot of your religious groups at that time had associations. 
uh, because of difficulties or questions about the baptism itself and the form of baptism. Uh, they then uh, eventually broke from that group and uh, merged with a group called the Mahoning Baptist Association. Uh, but it was inevitable that at some point that they uh, just become uh, an independent group all to themselves and they broke off from that association as well. Uh, in 1823, Alexander started a monthly paper. Uh, these monthly papers was a way that people would uh, communicate with each other and these papers would circulate through the whole country as people traveled from one part of the country to another. And you may get a paper that's a year old in one part of the country, but it's still new to you. And so he had this uh, called the Christian Baptist, this paper that he published. And, uh, uh, and it was very, very uh, well accepted. Uh, at the same time that he's doing these things up in, in Pennsylvania, there's another group in Kentucky, another Presbyterian group, uh, led by a man by the name of Barton Stone. Uh, Barton Stone uh, had a group uh, in the, the Kentucky Synod and uh, called the Springfield Presbytery. Uh, and uh, he became completely disenchanted with the uh, Presbyterian way of doing things. And he and his group decided that they would break off. And he wrote what is still one of the important documents of our organization's uh, history called The Last Will and Testament of the Springfield Presbytery, telling why we are breaking away from the Presbyterians, why we are not going to continue to be associated with this group, uh, because we just, you know, not because the Presbyterians were bad, but just that we believe differently. We want to do things in a different way. Somehow, these two groups, even though they were so far apart, uh, they ended up, uh, uh, Alexander Campbell and uh, Barton Stone uh, came uh, together and uh, in, uh, uh, eventually they merged their two groups. Uh, the merger of the group occurred uh, in January of 1832. Uh, while uh, on one of his travels, and uh, Alexander Campbell was quite an interesting man, he had a lot of political connections and important people that he knew from the Virginia State Legislature, people who were the four founders of the, uh, the United States. Uh, he knew many of men who were the early presidents. Um, and uh, he also had a really good friend that was uh, uh, he used to get together with on a regular basis. And they would have conversations a lot about uh, sheep. They both raised prize sheep. And, uh, you know, this man would refer to Alexander as, as Bishop Campbell, Bishop Campbell. Uh, and of course, there, there came a time when they had split and went in different ways. And uh, uh, Alexander was quite upset to find out that uh, at some point that uh, his friend had taken uh, a different road in life and ended up hanged as a traitor. His name was John Brown. John Brown. John Brown, <laughs> yes. So uh, he was a so so Alexander Campbell knew a lot of very interesting uh, people, including some early presidents, some important people. Uh, once, when uh, when when uh, one of the early elders of the church, a man, a colorful man by the name of Raccoon John Smith, uh, in Kentucky, uh, was riding along after the merger had occurred, and the group uh, was known the, the the Restoration Movement. The group was known as the Campbellites. Uh, and the Barton Stones group were called the Stoneites. Well, as Jack and John Smith was riding uh, on his circuit, he passed a Methodist minister, and the Methodist minister pointed at him and said, Campbellite, Campbellite. And he said, well, I'd rather be a Campbellite than to have no light at all. Uh, so they merged along about the time of January uh, 1832, and then we came to a point where uh, uh, the congregation uh, by 1849 uh, had about 200,000 members in the United States, and it even had some churches formed in Ireland and England. 
and so it was becoming an international organization. Uh, then we come to the days of the Civil War. The Civil War split most of your religious denominations completely. You see that evidence today by uh, the Southern Baptist, or it's a very big group. Uh, they, the, and they came strictly out of the Civil War. They became the Southern Baptist, and then other groups became Northern Baptist or attack on different names. The Disciples of Christ, or the Christian Church, as it was called at that time, uh, the Christian Church, uh, uh, we were the third largest denomination in the United States, and we were able to, even though we weren't able to associate across enemy lines, the northern and the southern churches were able to maintain some communication, and it just really didn't split us up uh, like it did other denominations. Uh, however, right before the Civil War began, uh, an incident occurred that was created controversy within the Brotherhood. And that is someone brought hymnals into the church services. And uh, hymnals were not part of the first century church. They didn't have these in the first century. So there were some, some that were opposed to this. But with the onset of the Civil War, the discussion kind of took a back seat. However, Right after the Civil War, in a place called Midway, Kentucky, someone brought a, and it was decided that they would bring a hand organ into the church service. A musical instrument. Musical instruments, of course, are spoken of often in religious services in the Bible in the Old Testament. But we don't have any reference, uh, specific references in the New Testament, particularly in Acts, about the use of musical instruments in worship services. So consequently, there were those that said, this is not good, this is, you know, the, the, the scriptures don't speak about this, so we should not do it. Uh, this caused a division within the brotherhood. Uh, a small group broke off, uh, which later became known as the Churches of Christ. Uh, since that time, uh, the Church of Christ, of course, has grown exponentially worldwide and the disciples of Christ percentage wise has actually gotten smaller so consequently uh, these two groups both came out of the restoration movement um, there have been many times that there have been attempts to reconcile and bring us all back together because one of the guiding principles that the Campbells established from the beginning was that denominations are basically bad that we should all be united under Jesus Christ and there should only be one church that we all are united under Jesus Christ. So we have tried uh, different times to reconcile with the Church of Christ um, and, uh, and uh, who knows, I think that over the years the divisions and the, 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 the directions that each group has gone in has led each group to a point where, well, we just can't compromise on that issue, or we don't want to compromise on that issue. And so it's been decided uh, in, in each case that, uh, that they should remain separate. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that then occurred that happened is that the, we have uh, annual conventions each year. And in 1926, uh, uh, the National Convention was held in Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. And at that point in time, uh, there was uh, another issue, that a couple of other issues that came up for discussion that people were concerned about. Uh, and we go right back to another issue about communion and sharing communion with somebody that has not been baptized by immersion was one that issue that, the, that this group brought up and says if they have not been baptized by immersion then they shouldn't be taking communion with the rest of us uh, and then there was this idea about missionary societies um, it became
became apparent and, and obvious that it would be very difficult for each individual church to support a missionary. And so a missionary societies were formed so that small churches could contribute their money into a pool and the missionary society would take the money from the different churches and use that pool of money to support a missionary uh, in, in a, some field or foreign country. Um, and, of course, uh, the idea of missionary societies is not in the New Testament. So consequently, there was some, uh, a lot of discussion about that. Uh, what ended up is in 1926, a man by the name of minister, Ohio minister named Pearl Wilshimer, uh, took his group, uh, who uh, was following these two principles, and they basically walked out of the convention, walked across the street to a different hotel and started their own convention. Mm -hmm. And they are still today uh, called the Independent Christian Churches. And uh, today, and I'm not sure just how they do it, but each church supports its own missionary. Uh, I'm not sure in what way, and I'm sure that missionary probably has to have more than one church supporting it, or more than one group supporting it, because many of these churches are too small to you know, give 100% support to a missionary. Well, that, that gives you a brief synopsis of the disciples of Christ, the Church of Christ, and the independent Christian churches. It tells you uh, who we are, our, our cousins, the Church of Christ. We, uh, we love them very much, the independent Christian churches also. Uh, and uh, but, but the divisions that have separated us uh, at this point are, are too deep uh, for most people's way of thinking to ever be reconciled. But we, uh, we still look at, uh, at each one of these groups and we still consider ourselves to all be uh, children of the Restoration Movement, the American Restoration Movement. Um, and that, that's, that's the basics of, of who we are. Um, I came into the Disciples Church personally in 1982. Uh, didn't know anything about it at the time. Uh, I had become completely disenfranchised uh, from uh, the religious group that I had grown up with, and from the church and denomination that I had grown up with. And uh, I had really no intentions of ever going back to church again. When I was 17, I knew everything I needed to know, so there was no point in going to church. They didn't have anything they could teach me. Uh, but when I got married to a lady who was a disciple of Christ, and she got me started going to the church, and I said, you know, this is what church ought to be. And uh, one of the things that I really love about the Disciples of Christ churches is that uh, there's, not a, uh, there's not as much judgmentalism there's not as much uh, uh, of the political maneuvering within the church of people wanting to be in control or tell everybody else what they should do. Uh, when I uh, came to the, to the Disciples Church, I was surprised that I wasn't hearing sermons about hellfire and brimstone. I was hearing sermons about the love of God. And, uh, and, and how we should be uh, work together and, and love one another. Uh, and, and I made a comment not long ago that you know, there are some things that, that, that I believe that, you know, yes, the love of God, but I also be, believe in the wrath of God as well, uh, that God can be judgmental. Uh, and I said to somebody not long ago, I said, you know, in the 17 years I've been a disciples minister, I've only heard two sermons about hell, and I preached both of them. So, uh, I think that if the disciples of Christ churches have uh, a shortcoming, it's that, that they are too one-sided uh, and, and don't often give a, uh, a complete uh, view or a complete, uh, what I think of as a complete teaching about all of the things that God is. Uh, very seldom in the disciples' churches do we hear, for the most part, very seldom uh, Old Testament sermons from the Old Testament. Uh, most of the disciples of Christ's churches, the ministers, uh, preach strictly from the New Testament. Uh, uh, 
unless, unless they get into Psalm, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, it's mostly from the New Testament. Um, and and I, I'm not like that. I, I teach the whole Bible. I preach the whole Bible. Uh, today my sermon was on uh, Psalm 34. Uh, and, and I have had Bible studies on, on many of the Old Testament books. And because I feel like that there is a lot that we need to know and learn from our history of our relationship with God. Uh, that God and His relationship with His people has a very, very long and wonderful and beautiful history. And we need to know about all of that. Uh, I know that, uh, that as a Disciples of Christ is a New Testament church, but uh, I just think that we just should not completely shut out the Old Testament as if it didn't exist. And I refuse to do that. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a maverick within the, uh, within the disciples' uh, brotherhood uh, because uh, I, don't always, I don't always follow the prescribed plan. Uh, I have a tendency to think outside the box and color outside the lines. Are you uh, available now for questions? Yes, I am. Uh, did you have a question? Not yet. The, um, I know, especially Churches of Christ have been accused of being very dogmatic. Yes. About, uh, and it sounds like the Disciples of Christ are a little bit the other uh, end of that spectrum. Yeah, you know, this term dogmatic, uh, I think the term itself is problematic. Uh, you know, aren't we all dogmatic about what we believe in? I mean, don't we all, uh, if we believe something strongly and we believe it intently in our heart, aren't we dogmatic about it? So I think everybody has a tendency to be somewhat dogmatic. Yes, the disciples of Christ have been called and referred to as being more laid back than the churches, churches of Christ. And, and that might be a better term, I don't know. I don't know that it is or it isn't. Um, I, I have had a, a great deal of association with the Churches of Christ and uh, love my Church of Christ brothers and sisters tremendously. Uh, disagree with them on some points, but here again, those are the points where we have liberality of thought. Uh, we still have, as far as I'm concerned, unity of knowing and believing that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. So I'm not sure that I would uh, I don't like categorizing uh, and putting a, a, a label on our Church of Christ brothers and sisters and calling them dogmatic. Uh, and even though I have in past, for lack of a better term, used that term myself, I still don't like it. Uh, you know, uh, we are, I guess, the time, we could be just as, say we are just as dogmatic about wanting our musical instruments. We are just as dogmatic about uh, having communion every Sunday. And I assume the Searchers of Christ do the same thing about the communion. That's part of who we are as part of the Restoration Movement. Is we have communion every Sunday because it says in the book of Acts, they met on the Lord's Day and they broke bread. That was communion. And uh, so we're just as dogmatic about the things that we believe in also. The, uh, there are a number of universities that are... Uh, associated with the Churches of Christ, for instance, Hardin University and Fried Hardman University and David Lipscomb and Pepperdine, I mean, and others. Uh, are there schools like that associated with uh, Disciples of Christ? Absolutely. Uh, TCU, Texas Christian University. Um, you, know, you have many of them. Uh, uh, you have... Uh, I know more about the history than I do the present. Uh, and uh, there were many colleges. There was uh, up in Ohio was Hiram College, which was a disciple university. Uh, during uh, the Civil War, uh, almost the entire male population of Hiram College followed one of their uh, professors, uh, or the president of the, of the college, uh, into the Civil War. Uh, his name was... Uh, was James Garfield. Hmm. He later became accidentally James became president. president. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and you had the Virginia Military Institute in the South that was strongly associated in, in some ways with, uh, with the Disciples Brotherhood. Uh, and they also uh, contributed greatly to the Civil War. 
Uh, but you have many different uh, disciples' colleges uh, around the country today. I'm not that familiar as much with the history. I'm more familiar with the history than I am with the present day uh, colleges. And I suppose it's true of the Christian church. It also has. I don't know about the independent Christian church, if they have universities or not. Yeah. I know that they do have some Bible colleges. Now, there were, there were theologians, and some were still uh, like McGarvey. James McGarvey. Who yeah. wrote the, uh, was he a part of that movement? Yes, James McGarvey was a very uh, important uh, fixture in the early uh, Restoration movement. Uh, he was part of Barton Stone's group, if I'm not mistaken. I'm assuming that because he came out of Kentucky uh, uh, from uh, uh, the Transyl, what was called the Transylvania uh, Institute, uh, Transylvania University. Uh, that was one of the early disciples' colleges in Kentucky. The whole section of Kentucky was called Transylvania. And uh, he wrote a number of commentaries that are still used today by uh, the churches of Christ and by disciples of Christ. Uh, so he was a very important uh, fixture uh, in, in our movement. And uh, very good uh, commentaries. Very good commentaries that are still pertinent for today. And um, uh, he was one of our one of our one of our big great theologians. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The. Uh, Freed Harvard University, for instance, which is was established, that uh, kind of evolved mm -hmm. uh, from some other schools that there in Henderson, Tennessee, 20 miles south of Jackson. That was in the, I guess that was uh, 30 years or so after the establishment. I think it came about about 1870 something. Like. Uh, well, 1870 something. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right about that. Uh, you know, you had, uh, you know. Everyone, of course, during the Civil War uh, suffered. Uh, I don't think that there was uh, any uh, group within or any family within Tennessee that may have suffered more uh, than those families in the state of Tennessee. Because Tennessee was the last state to secede from the Union. It was also the first state to go back into the Union. But you had a number of people in the state of Tennessee who just refused to participate in Brewer. Uh, and, and these people, and one family in particular, the Lipscombs, David Lipscomb, one of the, the founders in the Church of Christ, uh, they had a particularly difficult time because there were more Civil War battles fought in the state of Tennessee than there were any other state except Virginia. And so consequently, all of these people that wanted to remain independent, that did not want to participate in war and take sides, they were ostracized by everybody. Uh, and during the Civil War, uh, David Lipscomb and his wife had a child that died, and they had just a horrible time just trying to get from, from where they were at to the family burial and just to bury their child. Uh, because being independent and not taking sides, nobody wanted to let them cross their lines. Uh, the Confederates said, you're not one of us, you can't cross our lines. And the Union said, you're not part of us, you can't cross our lines. And they had a very difficult time. So, so Lipscomb was one of the ones that uh, didn't choose sides. He did not choose sides. The Lipscomb family stayed uh, neutral during the Civil War. Did Alexander Campbell, I mean, with his friendship with uh, John Brown, and John Brown definitely becoming involved. Yeah, John Brown was the abolitionist who was hung for yeah. the assault on the Harper's Ferry. Oh, right. Yeah, uh, and of course, Bloody Kansas was associated with, uh, with John Brown. Uh, really, by that time of the Civil War, uh, and of course, John Brown, that, that stuff happened before the Civil War actually got started uh, real good. Uh, because that was a lot of, uh, of the stuff going on in Kansas was going on uh, about slavery. Uh, what should be a slave state? What should not be a slave state? Um, and, and people often don't realize that secession from the Union was not a new idea. Uh, South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union in 1832. Uh, all of the southern states threatened to secede from the Union. And California became a state, and that's before the Civil War ever happened. But um, 
but what you, you have there is that uh, uh, some of these things that were going on and we get up to the time of the Civil War, Alexander Campbell is just a figurehead. Uh, he has gotten to the age that he is a figurehead and he, he died, I think, uh, probably uh, a year after the Civil War ended. Uh, but at the last national convention that he attended, uh, he did not participate. Uh, he sat in a chair at the head of the convention hall and slept most of the time. Uh, so he had gotten to the age that he was no longer uh, a decision maker within the Brotherhood during the time of the Civil War. The, um, it, it seems to me that, uh, that most people have, probably don't have any idea about how the Civil War affected uh, Christian churches across the United States of all, of all stripes. They, you know, they really don't. And, uh, you know, when you read, you start reading into the history of the Disciples' Brotherhood in the Civil War, what you find is that there were a number of uh, Disciples' ministers that were participants in the Civil War. Of course, many of your uh, military groups uh, had chaplains. They had the regimental chaplain or the court chaplain or the, the uh, company chaplain. And uh, some, of these, uh, some of these guys were really, really, uh, you had to you know, almost question their Christian attitude. Uh, there was one that made the comment during the Battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas, that uh, he didn't really want to kill people, but he wanted to maim them. He'd shoot them in the legs, because then it would take two soldiers to take the wounded one off the field. <laughs> uh, and he was very proud of the fact that he crippled as many Union soldiers as possible. Uh, you had another one who said that, uh, by golly, he wanted to put every Yankee on a bandstand and load up as much dynamite under it as he could and set it off with his cigar. <laughs> so, you had, you had a number of, of disciples, ministers, who were taking an active part in the Civil War. And, uh, you know, you have to wonder, of course, this was at a time of turmoil in our nation and, and in our union. And uh, so, yeah, most churches, most religious groups were affected in one way or another adversely. The disciples of Christ, we made it through the Civil War pretty pretty well without any divisions between our brotherhood north and south, uh, but we couldn't survive the musical instrument thing. Well, don't you think that that was largely because there was no sign or there, there was no association, really? Uh, really, I think that's probably it. There each, is, each church was autonomous. Each church was autonomous, and that's one thing that we are still very proud of in the Disciples of Christ. We have a regional minister in uh, Nashville. We have a, a national and a, a, a president, a general minister and president that isn't just the United States, but over the disciples' churches worldwide. And that's in Indianapolis. That's where the general minister and president is. Uh, the regional minister in Nashville, he can uh, make suggestions to us. Uh, he can tell us what he thinks. And we can follow his suggestions or completely ignore him. Well, in the Church of Christ, there was, there's no... Uh, no such thing as that even. Each yep. church is autonomous. Yep. And um, um, no uh, creed. No creed. But a lot of unlit, unwritten creeds. <laughs> and and, um, and things to do with the um, uh, uh, fact of I remember a debate held at Three Hardman in 65 on the question of carnal warfare. Two third year Bible students very, very good, very uh, interesting debate. So that subject hasn't gone away. It's still, a lot of these questions well, are still there. A lot of the questions are still there and will always be there. You know, when you start talking about warfare, you start talking about carnal warfare, or just carnality. You're talking about, people are going to have very definite thoughts and opinions about these issues. Uh, I don't know still don't think that I would still call them uh, creeds, uh, regardless of how strongly you feel about it personally. Uh, we have to understand what is a creed. Let's define that. What is a creed? A creed is a test of fellowship. That if you don't 
memorize and believe this creed and follow it, you cannot be in fellowship with us. That's what a creed is. And many denominations still have creeds. I don't know how strictly they follow that, but I know in the disciples of Christ, <clears throat> we have no creed. We have no test of fellowship. If you come to us uh, recently, well, just, just uh, yesterday, uh, uh, a lady that I know who grew up in the Disciples of Christ Church. She's married a man uh, about a month ago who's a Baptist. And uh, they have decided to join the Baptist Church. And uh, because even though he was already a Baptist, he was not a member of this particular Baptist Church. So they insisted that he and she both be baptized again. That was done yesterday. And of course she had never heard of such a thing, getting baptized again. And uh, so consequently, uh, you know, I made the joke. I said, well, Shannon, I mean, maybe it'll take this time. <laughs> but so many of your denominations, if you don't adhere to their creed or if you're not a part of their denomination, they're going to require that you be baptized again. Now, uh, the Church of Christ uh, is somewhat that way about baptizing people again because it, I grew up in the Baptist Church and when I was associated with the Church of Christ when I was in college, uh, they took me out at 11 o'clock at night down to the church and baptized me right there because they were afraid that something might happen to me before I could, could, could get baptized on Sunday. So I got baptized at 11 o'clock. That was my second baptism. Uh, in the Disciples of Christ churches, people come to our church and join us. Uh, we ask them, have you been baptized? And if they say, well, I was baptized as a baby, I was sprinkled, or, or you know, I was christened uh, by the Catholic priest. And I was, you know, we talk to them and say, well, we, we, we ask them what their belief is about Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and if they affirm that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and know that that's our only hope of salvation, we give them an option. You can get baptized again or not. Now, if we baptize, we baptize by immersion. But people who have been baptized in other denominations or other churches, even if it wasn't by immersion, if their baptism is acceptable to them and they don't want to be baptized again, we don't require it. I think that uh, it's largely, in a lot of, a lot of cases, it's the purpose of the baptize, baptism. They have to understand that it is for the remission of sins is, is, is the, oh, it's the words, terminology yeah, used for the, for the, You know, and we see that in the Bible. It says, uh, be, uh, be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, can you have remission of sins without baptism? That's another discussion for another time. Uh, we'll go, you know, I'm not going to get into that at this point. Uh, but, you know, uh, we just feel like that, you know, here's the issue. What, what, how do you define baptism? I mean, ultimately, the, the, the only definition I have ever come to understand about baptism is that baptism is applying water to the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, how that water gets on your head, I cannot see that it makes a whole lot of difference. The reality is, is that we try, and these historians and these uh, geologists and anthropologists, and they've determined that at the time when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, that at that time of the year, the river wasn't full of water anyhow, that it may have been a dry river baptizing, which means that only the head got wet. I don't know. I wasn't there. Now, if I say that to some people, that Jesus wasn't baptized by complete immersion, I get some people real upset real quick. But what I'm saying is, I don't think it really matters because the idea of baptism isn't how wet you get. The idea of baptism is what's in your heart. Do you, do you, uh, do you believe that debates and discussions of this matter are, are useful or not useful? Now... I remember in 1951, 52, uh, in Fulton, Mississippi, about 15, 20 miles east of Tupelo, my dad was the minister uh, in a debate with a man named Sam Rager, the Baptist. And in those days, there wasn't a lot of things to do. There wasn't a lot of television and stuff. 
And if you've ever seen the convocation of the, of the Pope and everything in the Vatican, where it's just full, the square in, in Fulton, Mississippi was totally full. Absolutely. The debate was held in the courthouse, courtroom. Yeah. And loudspeakers went out all over that. And it was full. Oh, yeah. It was high drama. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And um, these, uh, these things now seem to be almost passe. Nobody debates anybody about, you know, once in a while you will hear some kind of debate. You really, uh, other than political debates where people lie to each other and misquote the Bible, uh, <laughs> you don't really have debates anymore. And, and I'm not sure that that's good or bad. I don't know. I see the real purpose of these debates. And they used to have these back in the 1800s. Uh, they debate over infant baptism, they debate over communion and different subjects. And here again, they would gather huge numbers of people just to come hear the debate because it was an event and there wasn't nothing else to do anyway. It was one of their only forms of entertainment. And, or hanging. Uh, and uh, so consequently, you know, the, the purpose of debate, you got to understand what is the purpose of debate. If, if, if you have two people with opposing ideas, they're not going to convince each other uh, to change their mind. You're not going to convince the person you're debating to change your mind. So the, the, so the debate is for the audience and I don't think that the purpose of a debate is even to get people in the audience to change their minds. I think the purpose of a debate, and I think what is good about debates, is it gets people to thinking about issues. And once people start thinking about issues, then at some point, mentally and emotionally, they have to come to terms within their own heart, within their own mind, as to what they feel and think about these issues. And so it then sparks people to pick up their Bible and to read it, to study it. Uh, today they can go on the computer and Google it, you know, and to try and then come to some understanding of what they truly feel in their hearts on these issues instead of just offhandedly believing something that has been fed to them. Uh, this is why when I do Bible studies and sermons, I have told my congregation many times, I do not want you to agree with me all the time. I would much prefer that you often disagree with me because if you disagree with me, it's going to inspire you to pick up the Bible, to read it, to study it, and to examine this issue for yourself. And you're going to learn muddy more. You're going to learn a lot more from reading and studying and, and trying to see if you agree with me. You're going to learn more that way than if you just believe everything I tell you. And most people have very little idea of how big a role politics has, has played in the church, beginning all the way from the beginning with Constantine. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, that being the case, and you're talking about the Civil War and how politics have played a part in that. And then you've talked about how difficult it is uh, for Disciples of Christ, Christian Church, Church of Christ to compromise on anything. What do you think about the ecumenical movements and so forth for Christianity as a whole, where we're talking about the Catholic Church and the, and the Protestant Reformation and all the rest of it? What, is there any hope whatsoever of anything coming together closer, any unity there? You know, I really don't think so because, uh, you know, what, what uh, you know, Thomas Campbell and Alexander Campbell, they said denominations are bad. We need to have everybody who uh, believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior under one umbrella. Well, that's a little bit uh, simplistic to think that such a thing could ever happen because people are divided in so many ways on so many other issues that sometimes they just cannot get along with other groups that think differently from themselves. Uh, even within organizations like the Baptist, you have different branches of the Baptist church that have broken off over the years. You have the Independent Baptist, the Southern Baptist, the American Baptist. You have the Free Will Baptist. Uh, you know, I was on vacation once and I saw a little church that says uh, it was the First Christ Methodist Church of St. John the Baptist. Uh, I felt like they were probably trying to cover all of the issues and all of the bases with one church, but there was only one car parked out front, and I was pretty sure that was the minister. Uh, so I don't know, you know, 
the, I don't know that denominations are necessarily a bad thing because everybody is not going to believe the same thing in the same way. And if you just have one denomination, you're going to exclude so many people who, if they were allowed a little independence and liberty of belief and was able to get together with people that believe the same way they do, then they can still believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior. They don't have to be a part of our group. Let them have their own party. Let them have their own church. Because that way, more people are attracted to the gospel by having this diversity of choices. And whenever you have exclusion, you have a problem. You have a problem. That's, and, and, and to the detriment of each end of the individual. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you do. I want to thank you very much for uh, being with us on Core Concepts today. This is uh, My pleasure. a little different than, uh, than, but all of our our shows have been uh, pretty different. Did you have a question what, for you? Were you going to have him give his contact? Yeah, if you uh, you want to give uh, out a uh, phone or email or website or any kind of contact. Uh, yes, uh, I can give my uh, my cell phone number and my email. I don't do a lot of emails, so if I don't check it very often, call me on the phone. Uh, my email address is associated with my other business. Uh, it's weird, W-E-I-R, weird pest control at bellsouth.net. Uh, that's why many people call me the bug me. I'm an entomologist. And uh, Mr. Ware has killed my bugs. I, am, I, am, I, am, I, am an, I was an entomologist before I was a minister. Uh, my phone number, of course, is 901-212-6531. I welcome comments, questions. Where is your church? Uh, uh, my church, uh, I'm pastor of a small country church uh, out in the middle of Fayette County in the country, a little small country church called Pleasance Christian Church. And I've been out there 17 years, and uh, uh, they have been a real blessing to me. Uh, uh, they've really been good to me. Well, again, thanks. For thank you for letting me be here. Yes, thank you. I want to remind you that this program is sponsored by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics then, and also by Open Heart Spiritual Center. This is the location that we're in that we're uh, conducting this uh, event today. I want to invite you to go to YouTube. That's Y-O-U-T-U-B-E. -E. If you're not getting it this way, go to YouTube.com, type in Renford Broadcast Network. That's R-E-N-F-O-R-D. Then Broadcast Network. And you'll be able to view this uh, show, this talk with uh, Pastor Ware uh, anytime you want and can view many, many other guests of the Core Concepts series of lectures. Also, we have radio shows every night of the week uh, the, this is RBR Network, Radio by Renford, and you locate it by going to www.blogtalkradio.com, B-L-O-G-T-A-L-K, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Renford. And uh, uh, here are shows that are being hosted from the Netherlands, from New York to Denver. So uh, join us on either one blogtalkradio.com forward slash Renford or the Renford Broadcast Network on YouTube. And thanks for being with us on Core Concepts. Have a good evening.